So for the first talk, we're delighted to introduce our first speaker of the day, Professor Christopher Jackson from the University of Manchester with his talk, 3D Seismic Reflection Data, Has the Geological Hubble Retained Its Focus? Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me and see me and I'll share to the screen now. And unless I hear that you can't see me or hear me, I will start. So um, yeah, no, thank you so much for inviting me to give one of the talks at this year's Herdman Symposium. I think I was there four years ago in person um, to give a talk uh, and it was much fun. So it was a um, yeah, real excitement to be asked to come back. It means that I obviously did enough right last time that I got an invite back. Um, yeah, so um, today I'm going to talk about um, 3D size and reflection data. And, and this is a geophysical tool some of you would have heard of and some of you may not have. And I'm going to impress upon you, hopefully, the value it has for geologists like me and why I'm a massive fan of these types of data for answering a range of earth science problems. And what I'm going to do in the talk is try and make it such that even if you have limited experience with using these types of data that, you know, after the first few slides, you'll know what it is. And then for the rest of the talk, you'll know how it's being applied. So where does this rather strange uh, talk title come from? Well, it comes from this paper in 2005 by um, Joe Cartwright and, and Mas Husa, who's here on the, on the right, let's go to the laser pointer. And they wrote this paper called 3D Seismic Technology, The Geological Hubble. And it was really awesome. And it massively inspired me at a time when I was just coming back into academia from working in industry for a while. And this kind of text I've highlighted in red has always struck me. Okay, so they talked about this, this new type of data or this, this, this data which was becoming more widely available called 3D Seismic and they compared it to the Hubble telescope. And you know, the Hubble telescope, after they got the mirror fixed on it, it had this resolving power, like they said here, it, was, it yielded some fascinating insights into, you know, kind of things out in the solar system. And they were saying that this 3D seismic data could do the same for problems we have on Earth. You know, it could provide a major stimulus for research into a range of geological processes and products for, for many years to come. And what was very exciting at this particular time, although 3D seismic data had been widely used in the hydrocarbon industry for looking for hydrocarbon resources deep beneath the Earth's surface, it was only just becoming available freely to academics to use. So you could then break away from using it solely for looking for resources and just to start questioning much uh, broader topics of earth structure and evolution. So let's get into this. What's, what is 3D seismic reflection data? Well, this is a geologist um, view of, 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 of kind of geophysical data, shall we see, say. So, you know, the geologist might um, view a, a, a geophysicist as those who like producing seismic images. And they're, you know, the, the kind of nerdy guy here on the left. And, you know, they're the ones who like, um, you know, playing with the hard sums and understanding how to acquire the data and process it and, and so forth. And then the geologists, you know, they probably look at themselves in this sort of way, right? They're the cool hipster kids on the right hand side who are asking all these like cool earth surface and subsurface problems and answering them. So these are the seismic interpreters. A geophysicist may look at this a completely different way. You know, a geophysicist may say, okay, yeah, we do like producing these seismic images. And you know, and there's a lot of physics underlying the production of these images, which then we give to these blooming geologists on the right hand side here, who like coloring them in, okay. And this is one of the kind of old tropes of um, size and reflection data is it's simply coloring in and you know all of the hard stuff and all the numbers are all being done by the geophysicists who produce the images that the geologists use and I'm going to finish my talk by hopefully uh, proving to you that that's definitely not the case. So let's get everybody on the same page the complete idiot's guide to why rocks and wiggles are related so how do we see rocks underneath the earth and how do we see the structure within them. Well, this is an image here, like a diagram showing a standard marine acquisition. So here we have a boat sailing on the sea. Behind it, it has a source of energy. In this case, it's called an air gun. It's a big, um, it basically generates a big bubble that pops. And the energy from that pop, that acoustic energy goes down into the Earth's subsurface and bounces back off these different rock layers and is recorded by these things called hydrophones. And these are things which are listening essentially behind the boat. So there's a boom, 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 every kind of, you know, few tens of seconds. And, and that's building up this image of the Earth's subsurface. And it's essentially like a CT scan of what's beneath the feet or beneath our feet or beneath the oceans. The amount of energy that comes back to the hydrophones 
is a function of something called acoustic impedance. And that varies as a function of how dense the rocks are and how fast the sound waves, these black lines travel through them. So it's a convolution of density and velocity. And that generates something called um, a reflection coefficient. So that's the reflect, that's the contrast in the in these physical properties beneath, for example, these kind of differently shaded tan colored layers here. That's all I really need to tell you about the principles of seismic reflection imaging. But what's important for us as we go through this talk is that the, the velocity, the speed in which these sound waves travel through these rocks varies as a function of rock type. So as you can see here, sedimentary rocks, these are all these ones here, they all have these P wave velocities, these push-pull velocities in kilometers per second of about two to five kilometers per second. That's how long it takes a sound wave to travel through these sedimentary rock types. In contrast, these igneous rock types, these metamorphic rock types have much faster velocities, above five and a half. The difference between those two different types of rocks arises because of the lithification state of those rocks, or actually the properties, the density and velocity. Remember, igneous and metamorphic rocks are crystalline, and therefore they don't really have any pore spaces in them. So the sound waves travel very efficiently through the crystal structure of these types of rocks. But sedimentary rocks are porous. So some of the energy which is produced, let's say, in the air gun behind the boat is lost within that pore space. And we don't get as much uh, efficient transport of the, of the sound waves. So they're slower at transporting that, that sound. So you can see we have, by building up these different rock layers, we can have different acoustic impedances, different reflection coefficients, and therefore we'll get different amounts of energy coming back um, to the hydrophones. So let's look at it in a 2D sense before we then start to apply it to some problems. Um, so this is a, a well, this is some well data. Okay, so this is from a borehole that's been drilled beneath the earth. For scale, this is 100 meters. Okay, so we're looking here at about 350, 400 meters of rock, so quite a lot. You can see the sonic log. This is where they've measured the sonic velocity of the rocks as they've drilled the hole. You can see this, it's fairly stable, then it suddenly um, decreases or increases. This is sonic slowness, actually. So it decreases in here or increases in here, sorry. And the density of the rocks, you can see, increases here as well. And what we're going from are mudstones into chalk. And you can see what happens as a function of that big change in sonic, a big change in density. We get a big change in AI, the acoustic impedance, and therefore here on the left hand side we get a big spike in the seismic reflection profile here. So that big change in lithology between mud and chalk is visible as a kind of expression in the, the acoustic energy that's returned to the Earth's subsurface, uh, re returned to the Earth's surface, sorry. So what does this look like then? You know, what do these seismic reflection profiles look like? Well, here's a seismic profile from offshore southern Norway, okay? Let's get you into the scale here. This is one kilometer for scale here in the horizontal. And you can see that the vertical scale is in TWT, two-way time. Because remember, when we're imaging um, using seismic data, we're not imaging in meters or feet, we're imaging in time, because it's how long it takes those sound waves to go down and come back up. But anyway, just for simplicity, convert these two kilometers. So you can see we're looking down about two or three kilometers into the Earth's subsurface. The seabed is about here, and you can see these beautiful structures in here. We can see these layers in here. These are sedimentary rock layers. Down in here, we've got some more uh, mushy seismic signal, and this is actually deeply buried sedimentary rocks and some crystalline rocks, actually. So you can see from this, we can see lots of Earth's surface structure, Earth's subsurface structure, these normal faults and these dipping beds. We can also apply these sorts of data to stratigraphic analysis as well. So here's a seismic profile, hit 250 meters here for horizontal scale and 25 meters for vertical scale. And you can see in here, these little white dashed lines are these incisions. So imagine if you've been out into the field to look at some geology in the field, you see these sand filled channels. Um, these are just those similar things, but imaged um, at about three kilometers in this example here. So we can image both stratigraphy and basin structure. So why bother with 3D seismic? Why don't we just stick to 2D? Because if we can sail this boat and collect like this broad grid of data, what benefit does collecting three-dimensional data give us? Well, let's look at this map view image here. And this is one kilometer for scale. And each of these dashed lines is a seismic profile. So this is imagine where a boat has sailed and the boat sailing has been two kilometers apart. It's given us this grid. 
And in this seismic data, we might see some faults, okay? So here's a fault here. You can see the offset of these colored reflections in here, these colored horizons. So these are normal faults dipping to the right. And we might see those faults on, you know, on this line, on this line, and this line here and here. And all we can do then is just to draw a line between them, okay? So we just join the dots. We say this fault is pretty straight. It's one single fault because we only see it every two kilometers apart. So we're having to guess. So imagine being in the field and going to a valleys, which are two kilometers apart and having to guess what's between them. And then we could look at channels as well. You know, we could see channels like on in here where I've sketched in these channel shapes in here, the in David Gamboa's work. And you can see we might see the channel at these blue dots. And all we can do is join the dots up between those channels. And we might then drill a well, okay? We might try and drill at position one, two, and three. And we might try and find the sand that is in the channel. So we could kind of guess what's between those. But remember, we're having to drill between the, the actual profiles themselves. The problem is, is when we then get to the 3D seismic data set, what we see is this, right? So what you're seeing now is um, the true subsurface structure of the Earth. The reason the 3D data is, is more is richer is because we lose what is called spatial aliasing. With 3D data, remember now, we don't have a profile every two kilometers. We actually have a profile with modern data sets every 12 and a half meters. And that's kind of the width of a, or the length of a, a kind of standard terraced house in the UK. So you've got this incredibly densely sampled um, subsurface image. And you can see here that suddenly, instead of having one major fault, we actually have three faults. So we have a segmented normal fault. And this segmented fault, normal fault is separated by these undeformed zones in here, which we call relay ramps. And we see as well that this channel, which we thought had a little wiggle in it, is actually very, very sinuous. It's what we'd call a meandering channel. These, you know, we, we, th these structures here are present in this image on the left. It's just that we don't have the sampling to really work that out. So now having told you about, um, you know, the method itself and why it's good for understanding the Earth's subsurface structure in, 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 in a lot of detail, I'm now going to take you into, the, into a few examples. I'm going to work my way from microscopic applications of 3D seismic data, so at the grain scale, to macroscopic, so we're going to be looking at crustal deformation at relatively modest scales. And then we're going to go all the way up to using 3D seismic data to look at megascopic processes. And by megascopic, I mean geodynamics, the very way in which the Earth's crust and mantle deforms. So now let's start at the microscopic scale, because surely this technique can't really help us understand, you know, the kind of physical changes in sediments, sedimentary bodies themselves and when they turn to rock. So one of the things you're taught when you learn seismic reflection data is that each of those reflections, as you see in this image here, is a timeline. And that comes from, you know, images like this, right? So what I'm going to play now is a, is a video, and this video is going to show you a delta, so a body of sediment building out, in this case, into a, into a body of water. It could be a lake or it could be the ocean. And you can see here, if I just go back here, that this, this thing I'm sketching out here is a timeline, you know, the rocks here, are the same age as the rocks down here. These are fluvial rocks, these are marine rocks, but they're all the, they're all the same age. Now let's play this video. And you can see as sea level rises, you know, this delta's built out, but all of these black dashed lines here are timeline, these black solid lines, sorry, are timelines. And then eventually sea level falls, we've got another set of timelines and then sea level rises and the delta is forced back. You can see you build up this very complex stratigraphic architecture, but each of those lines is a timeline. And there's a really good example where that law, quote unquote, falls down. And when is that? So I'm going to start off by telling you about seismic diagenesis. This was worked on by Tilo Rona as part of his PhD with Masusa and Kevin Taylor. And another thing I want you to take away from this talk is that seismic data is amazing for bringing people together. It's a really good way of bringing people with different um, skill sets and interests together to work on subsurface and geological problems in general. Mads is a geophysicist, Kevin's a geochemist, and I'm a, I do everything. <laughs> but, you know, here what we were looking at is this, this, this idea that opal A, when it heats up and is buried, turns into opal CT. So these are silica rich mudstones, which are rich in opal. These are tests. This is SEM images of these tiny uh, shells of these creatures. As they heat up and get compressed and buried, they turn into crystalline opal. 
and that happens as at different temperatures okay so a play is is kind of uh, stable at anything up to about 50 degrees above that it transforms into crystalline opal and then at 60 to 80 degrees crystalline opal turns into quartz okay so as we bury those different um sediments they convert okay so there's a there's a there's a process which occurs and as a function of that process we have porosity loss within these sediments and also the expulsion of water so just lithification so what happens if we go and you know how does that how on earth does that relate to seismic data well this is a borehole from the north sea which tilo worked on and here you can see this is a long piece this is about 800 meters of core of, of well data in here so almost a kilometer you can see here, here's the amount of opal A he sampled in, in these rocks. So he went and picked out all these tiny samples and you can see that there was over 20% by volume opal A in these mudstones. But beneath about 1.25 kilometers, all the opal A decreased in volume and suddenly we got a lot more opal CT. And we also saw that coincided with a big change in porosity. Suddenly we had this big porosity decrease. So you can see relatively high porosities and then a step about 1,200 meters depth and then relatively low porosities. And that's because as these rocks are buried, these sediments, sorry, are buried, they actually compact. And remember, as I showed you earlier on, that density and velocity are two of the key ingredients for acoustic impedance and reflection coefficient. So you can start to think now, maybe this diagenetic change in here could manifest on seismic data because the rocks are undergoing a fundamental change in their, their properties. So there's the opal A, there's the APL CT, and there's that transformation zone where we go between the two phases. So there's just that data again, just kind of shown schematically on the left hand side. So what does this look like in seismic data? Well, it looks like this. So this is a big seismic profile across them, just where I'm sitting here offshore in Norway. And um, there's APL A, APL CT, and APL ACT in the transformation zone. And if you look really closely where I'm tracing out, you might convince yourself, or I might be able to convince you, there's a weak reflection going through here and it actually comes out through here. It kind of comes through here. Whereas all the rock layers are actually dipping gently this way. This is actually the opal ACT diagenetic boundary expressed in the seismic data as a function of the fact that these rocks in here are denser and have lower porosity than the rocks above. So we're actually getting a reflection coming back off the diagenetic boundary itself, not just off the rock layers. So that's kind of an important observation. And in this case here, the, the diagenetic boundary is quite subtle, it's quite flat. But there are more spectacular examples of this seismic diagenesis. So these, these, these microscopic changes and these, these sub-microscopic almost changes in rock properties manifesting at the, the, the basin scale. And this is here from the Mura Basin offshore Norway. You can see here this high amplitude reflection, this bright reflection, which is stepping up and down and up and down. And these are all um, biosilicious mudstone. So all these very fine grain rocks, but rich in opal, uh, rich in silica, really. Above here, boreholes tell us there's opal A and below is opal CT. And when you map that horizon out, that boundary, it's absolutely incredible. It looks like bubble wrap. So this is 10 kilometers for scale here. So, you know, you can map these diagenetic boundaries truly at the base and scale, and they're all being driven by these, these poor scale changes in, in the sediment physical properties. In addition to simply being a pretty picture, this is telling us something quite fundamental about how the diagenetic boundary advances through the rocks as the rocks are buried, right? So as the sediments are buried, how does the diagenetic boundary move upwards through the rocks? Because clearly it's not uniform, right? There's areas where the diagenetic boundary is going forward faster than adjacent areas. And, you know, those observations allow you to become quite, um, if not quantitative, but semi-quantitative about that. So here, the argument is that through time, as the opal A rich rocks subside through this, this kind of this 60 degree isotherm essentially, and convert to opal CT, we get this non-uniform advance of the diagenetic boundary. You can see that it builds out faster here than it does in these adjacent areas. So like this, so, you know, we can start to get very semi-quantitative about some of these processes, which otherwise we'd be forced to look at just microscopically, and we wouldn't really understand the, the true spatial dimensions of this, this kind of fundamental earth surface processes, the diagenesis of sediments. So let's go to something quite different, as they say. Um, 
And we're going to take you to, to volcanoes now. So we're going to move up in scale. And volcanoes are awesome, right? Obviously, and Janine's on the call, so I have to say that. But volcanoes are very challenging to study. You know, they're, they're dangerous, more active. Modern volcanoes can be quite, you know, hazardous to work around. Um, and, um, you know, looking inside of them is difficult when they're exposed at the Earth's surface for, for the obvious reasons as captured here. But we do have ways of looking at modern volcanoes, okay? We can use geophysical data. And what you're looking at here is, a, is um, basically a seismic image across Mount St. Helen from the I IMUSH project. And this is um, looking at wave speed data. So red in here is, is where those sound waves I talked about earlier on are going quite slowly. And here are where the sound waves, blue areas are where the sound waves are going quite quick. And, and where it's going slowly, this is where we probably have a mush so semi-molten rock. And here in blue is where we have crystalline rock. And what you can see is a nice magma chamber, a shallow one and a deep one sitting underneath Mount St. Helens. We then can add on top of that, um, these, are, these, these pink circles here are uh, earthquakes. So this is earthquakes co-located on this, this, this seismic tomographic image on the left. And you can see they're defining um, a stream of earthquakes right underneath the central conduit. So from these sorts of images, seismicity data and these relatively coarse um, tom tomographic images, we can build up some idea of what's going on beneath volcanoes, so what the feeder systems look like. Arguably, though, seismic data is a really good tool to use when we're looking at these subvolcanic plumbing systems because we have this situation as shown here in the field from Greenland. We have igneous rock, so very dense, very fast, acoustic speeds of above five and a half, encased in these slow, these layered rocks in here. So we should be able to get a reflection back from, in this case, these sills. And this is work I've been doing with Chiliang Sun and uh, Craig McGee. So what do these you know, these magmatic products look like in seismic data. Well, they're stunning. This is a seismic image from offshore um, Southern Australia, a place called the Bight Basin. So this is seawater in here. So this is the seabed. This is going down about a kilometer beneath the earth, uh, beneath the seabed. 10 kilometers for the horizontal scale in here. And straight away, hopefully your eyes are drawn to these high amplitude bodies in here, labeled with these L's and S's. These are igneous sills crystalline so not magma not magma anymore they're crystalline but we're seeing them fossilized and, and we're imaging them with seismic data above them as well are these triangular blobs in here uh, which are very reflective you can see how deep and bright those blues and reds are compared to these overlying sedimentary layers these are volcanoes and this horizon here this blue horizon is eocene it's about 42 million years ago so let me just scroll you across here. You can see these gorgeous structures in here. There's a big fold, uh, which we call a forced fold above these sills. We've got this big volcano in here, which is about half a kilometer tall. We've come all the way to the right-hand side of this profile. So we've gone across about 120 kilometers offshore of Southern Australia. And we can see here a sill and even a, a lacolith as well. And you see how both of these types of intrusions have these nice, um, ground deformations above them. So remember, as that magma is in place in the Earth's crust, we have to deform the Earth's crust, the sediments above, to make space for that inflating sill-like body. These are 2D data here, and I just show this line because I think it's incredible, but we also have 3D images as well. And obviously, if we have 3D images um, and their lines are every 12 and a half meters, we can, we can see kind of very complex relationships such as seen here. You know, here's a sill, um, this is what we call a saucer-shaped cell or a tulip-shaped cell. And you can see it's being fed by another cell. So we can start to look at these in 2D, but better than that, we can map these in fully three dimensions. Just for scale, because I always forget to point this out, this is a huge cell, okay? This is one kilometer in the horizontal scale, one kilometer in the vertical scale. So the diameter of this cell is about four or five kilometers, and that the height of this sill, and in fact, this is almost like a dike-like limb on this sill. This is extending about three kilometers up through the Earth's crust. So these are huge bodies, and we are able to image them, as shown in, on the right here, in fully three dimensions. And what's nice about this example here from New Zealand um, and some work um, one of the uh, MSI students did here, Jennifer Reeve, was you know we looked at a way that magma could be fed by deep sills into shallow sills. So one way of ascending melt through the Earth's crust was by sills feeding sills. So not big magma chambers, but these more distributed 
magma rich bodies and, and we, we can do that because we have these fossilized examples. So hopefully I've convinced you now we can see these igneous sills in seismic data, we can look at the relationship to the ground deformation, but can we be more quantitative about this? And this is something I sort of promised you at the start of the talk I'd, I'd lead us towards is, is some quantitative, act, 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 uh, quantitative elements of seismic reflection interpretation. So let's stay with Australia, but let's go to the Northwest Shelf now. Here's another seismic profile. This is um, a, a sill that we've shaded in red here. This is intruded into late Jurassic mudstones. We have two horizons we've mapped above that sill, a red horizon here and this blue horizon here. And you can see a bunch of normal faults adjacent to the sill, but also in the crest of this dome here. We can go away, we can map the sill in fully three dimensions over a huge area as can as we can for the fold above it. And if we map the fold above it, the red horizon, you get this really nice image in here. So sorry for the color bar if, you, if, if this is hard to deal with in some of these images because we haven't updated these, but the red where I'm kind of indicating here is shallow and the blue areas in deep. So what you're looking at here is a pimple, a spot. You're looking at the dome above this sill. So what's amazing here is we can actually look at the ground deformation above intruded igneous bodies and the, the edge of the sill is this black dashed line in here. And what we can actually do beyond that is be quantitative. We can measure the thickness of the sill and we can compare it to the amount of deformation in the late Jurassic of the Earth's seabed, right? So how much magma was intruded and how much did the Earth deform? And why is that important? Well, one way in volcanic terrains and we can try and predict where a volcano is going to erupt or, you know, where um, and how, how much might erupt is by measuring the ground deformation, because we can't obviously always see this or ever see this. We can only measure, as you can see here, this ground deformation. So if we go away and measure a bunch of these, OK, on this X axis here is intrusion thickness. So this is from the bite basin. So this is intrusion thickness here. And that's the that's the thickness here. And on. The y axis here is the amplitude of the fold. The one to one line is here. That means that the amount of magma that comes in in terms of its thickness is fully translated into ground deformation. But what you see is all of those dots fall beneath the one to one line. Very rarely in these ancient examples do we see evidence that all of the sill thickness, the magma that was being intruded, is expressed at the Earth's subsurface. And that's important if we're going to try and invert the magma thick or the magma volume from the associated ground deformation. And this was work which was done by uh, Freddie Briggs and um, Bogdan Galenkov, who are two uh, MSI students who worked with us a, a number of years ago. So you can see we can be quantitative there. Let's go above the plumbing system and look at the volcanoes themselves. So we can now start to effectively X-ray the volcanoes. This is from the Bight Basin again. Seabed is here. There's that green horizon, which was blue confusingly earlier on, but that's a Middle Eocene. So this is a Middle Eocene volcano. And inside we can see all these nice reflections that we, we're imaging beneath the, the top of the volcano TV. And we can actually kind of map out different layers as I've shown you in the animation. Um, one reason we think there's lots of reflections here in these volcanoes is this is where lava and sediments are um, deposited on top of each other because this volcano didn't erupt overnight. It was, in, it was erupted intermittent or by uh, intermittent eruptions. Whereas here in the center of the volcano is more transparent because this is much more um, uh, highly intruded by lots of sills and, and dikes. So the imaging is poorer inside. Again, can we be quantitative? Well, yeah, we can, you know, so we can go away and these are some volcanoes we've recently worked on from the South China Sea. These are little um, Pleistocene volcanoes. You can see they're poking out the seabed here. Nice volcanoes, flat bases, lava flows inside, um, everything's well behaved, but then we get these awful volcanoes in here, which are sticking out the seabed, but hopefully you can see underneath them, there's a big crater, which we're showing in the sketch below. So you can see there's this big crater underneath these volcanoes and we probably don't think of that right because if we just see a volcano at the earth's surface we probably just assume it's been erupted onto the seabed or the free surface sorry my kids have all just come back in the house um and what we think is happening here is that the dikes are ascending up to near the seabed 
and we're evacuating out a crater by the interaction between the, the, the very hot magma and the cold seawater and some of the vigorous processes occurring as those two mix to give us a crater first and then a volcanic edifice on top. We can see these examples again here. There's a big crater underneath this volcano here from the South China Sea. What we can also do here is, is map out um, the lava flows which are coming away from this volcano. So you, I'm just tracing out the top of the volcano for you here. And if you look at the lava flows here, this is what we call an amplitude map. So this is where we look at the strength of the reflections um, in, the, in the seismic volumes. You can see now here and on the sketch below these beautiful lava flow channels. And you see these channels in here and these lava flow lobes. Um, what was amazing about this is when we, we did this big study, and again, to stress this idea that you can be quantitative with these data, we thought it would be interesting to go away and measure how much material was within the volcano itself, so the volcanic edifice, versus how much material were in these long run out lava flows. So these, these kind of greens and yellows and pinks. So you can see where the lavas run away to. You can collect a bunch of data. I'm not going to talk through this table to you. All I want to take away from this is that for these deep water volcanoes, only three to 50% of the total erupted volume was within the edifice itself. 97 to 50% of the extruded material was actually in these lava flows, which had ran out about 10 kilometers away from these submarine volcanoes, which is interesting if you go and look at modern bathymetric images of or, or images of modern bathymetric uh, image volcanoes here and these are from uh, Tonga what you're looking at here is a pimple you remember the pimple I showed you from the northwest shelf this is a pimple above a sill in here you can see so you know you have a very poor understanding of what's underneath the um, underneath you know driving this but it's thought to be a, a sill as well and it's thought that there was a vault lava flows have ran away from this 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 force fold in here and one way they've tried to understand that is by looking at um, uh, what we call backscatter data. So looking at um, basically backscatter images of, of, of beneath the seabed. So trying to work out, you know, these white areas are where there's lots of energy coming back versus where there's less energy coming back and trying to work out what type of flows they, they are. Now, lava flows are, are kind of interesting because you know, we, we hadn't really thought about imaging seismically lava flows, but it turns out it's possible. So again, going back to some of these South China Sea lava flows we looked at just to finish on volcanoes, um, we saw that, okay, here's this small volcanic center in here. Here's the top of the lava flow, which is quite rugose, I'm tracing out in here. But hopefully you can see the bottom of the lava flow in here is actually quite rugose. There's lots of erosion at the base of these, these deep water lava flows. And we think it's because the lava, which was being erupted at relatively high temperatures, was actually mechanically dredging the wet and cold sediments on the seabed. So it was evacuating out and actually causing quite a lot of erosion. And if you think about that with these bathymetric images and backscatter images, spectacular though they are, you can't really see what's going on underneath these volcanoes. So it's very hard to look at the lava um, substrate interactions, but with these seismic reflection images, we can. Just a couple more examples before I conclude, and, and just to take you to one thing that I've spent a lot of my career kind of looking at, which is the structure of normal faults, and just to highlight some of the geohazard or the value of 3D seismic data to geohazard assessment. I'm going to take you back to this example I showed you right at the start of the talk where I made the argument that 3D seismic data reduced this spatial aliasing. And, and in this case, what we saw was that the, the fault was actually one, two, three relatively short segments instead of a single large through-going fault. Now that's important if we want to try and understand how big an earthquake could be generated by a fault because you know, kind of scaling relationships suggest that bigger faults produce bigger earthquakes. Therefore, it's really important to know the size of the fault. And that problem is kind of captured here in the sketch by Roger Solivar from, from, from 2008. So imagine this, okay, so in A, you've got a fault segment at the Earth's subsurface, and there's a fault segment here as well. 
And these two faults are actually physically separated, okay? So the biggest earthquake that can be generated is dictated by the length of this fault or the amount of displacement on this fault, because these are quite short faults, 40 kilometers long. But what happens if, rather than being two physically separate faults, there was actually one single fault beneath our feet, but it actually split into two separate faults as it got near the surface. So we were measuring this, but actually beneath the surface, there was a much bigger fault. So instead of having a fault which was 40 kilometers long, we had a fault which was 70 kilometers long. That fault would potentially be able to generate a far more substantial earthquake. Seismic data has been revolutionary, I would say, in helping us understand the 3D structure of normal faults. So this example here from the Taranaki Basin, so this is offshore New Zealand. It's a kind of odd image. What you're looking at here is a 3D image of a fault surface that Mark Gieber has mapped in three dimensions. For scale there is in the top left, it's two kilometers. So this is a you know, big structure. You can see down at depth, there's one fault. And actually, as you come up towards the Earth's surface, there's actually two separate fault segments separated by this relay zone. We can then obviously slice and dice the 3D volume to look at that in more detail. And if we take a slice deep down, um, you know, near the base of this fault, we can see indeed it looks like one fault. So this is um, what we call a variant slice. I don't need to go into the details, but this is essentially a, a map of um, the structure at that particular depth in the earth. So imagine it's like a, um, a topographic relief map of it. So this is one single fault in here, and there's a couple of what we call splays. If we come up to this level in here, you can see that, oh, suddenly it's quite different. There's one fault segment here, there's one fault segment here, and then there's this unbreached relay between them with a small fault. And as we come up to the shallowest depth in here, we have this relay with no faults in between. So you can see that vertical change in the fault structure, which is related to the vertical um, connectivity and therefore the potential seismogenic hazard uh, posed by faults such as this, because essentially these faults are a lot bigger than we think they are based on surface observations alone. So I'm going to conclude by taking you to the largest scale of application of 3D seismic data. So we've gone from microscopic and we've gone all the way now up to geodynamics. And geodynamics sort of relate to the interaction of the Earth's you know, mantle and, and, and the behavior of the, Earth, the Earth's crust as well. And one of the key processes in geodynamics is this idea of, of mantle support. And in fact, uh, Jill Apps um, in two talks time is gonna talk a lot about um, the dynamics of the mantle and this idea that it can provide this subplate support, you know, so we put this warm, hot, less dense stuff underneath the lithospheric mantle and we actually can have some um, uplift of the Earth's crust and deformation and, and related volcanism. So how does seismic data help us with this? So I'm going to take you here to the North Atlantic. So I'm sitting actually about here at the moment in Bergen in Western Norway. Um, so here you can see um, the North Atlantic formed due to um, Eocene to Paleocene um, breakup, um, so oceanic spreading, uh, Iceland being the surface manifestation of some of the igneous uh, activity associated with that. And I'm going to talk about two different areas. I'm going to show you some data from a place called the East Shetland Basin, which is in the North Sea, and a place called the Ferris Shetland Basin, which is in the Northeast Atlantic Ocean. And associated with the breakup of the North Atlantic was this thing called the Iceland plume, which again, some of you will have heard of. This was this idea that there was this big buoyant uh, slug of melt which came up and actually deformed the Earth's um, crust and actually spread out and sort of deformed the surrounding regions. And as you can see from this animation, the East Shetland Basin and the Ferro Shetland Basin sit within the area of influence of this Iceland plume, which was thought to have um, been most active around about 55 uh, million years ago. And this is what that Gaia um, did, uh, um, Stokely Quay did for her PhD um, along with me and Gareth Roberts. And Gareth is the kind of geodynamicist. Um, Gaia kind of has a range of interests, including planetary geology. And, you know, again, I, I'm interested in sedimentology and basin structure. So, again, it was this nice meeting point for all of us to kind of explore a really interesting problem. So here's a seismic profile from the East Shetland Basin. Seabed is up in here. This is one kilometer for scales. And this is, we're looking at about what, about two kilometers of, of the Earth's subsurface here beneath the seabed. 
there's a line drawing in here. There's, this is a very busy slide. I don't really want to get kind of bogged down in the details here. All I want you to concentrate on in here is what I'm sketching out here, which is this red dashed line where it says incised channel. So what there is, there's an incision surface in here. There's a, there's a place where there's been a lot of erosion into this thing called the Montrose group. And the Montrose group are marine mudstones. These, these brown stippled things in here are effectively deltaic and fluvial rocks. And then this thing called the Stronce group above these blue colors again are again marine mudstones. So we have this, um, what we call the uh, non-marine sandwich. Okay, so we had non-marine rocks encased in marine rocks, which is kind of interesting. What was as interesting was the red horizon. If you map that out, you see this really spectacular relief in here. So again, here, white is shallow, green off into here is deep. And you can see in here on the edge of here, you can actually see there's this, um, this is basically a, a valley coming out here. There's a fluvially cut valley, which I'll draw on. So Gaia did some um, hydraulic analysis on this. And there's actually a river system, a valley system, ancient valley system, Paleocene to Eocene age being imaged two kilometers beneath the North Sea. But it's really important with seismic data to integrate um, borehole data. And you can see on this profile here, there's a number of wells which have drilled through this stratigraphy. So what does the stratigraphy say about the stratigraphic context of this valley system and this non-marine sandwich? Well, again, quite a busy image in here. This is um, about one and a half kilometers of depth in here. Um, what I want to draw your attention to is, is just this bit here, the non-marine sandwich, blue marine rocks, blue marine rocks, and then about 200 meters of non-marine rocks in here. And the red horizon was the, was the um, valley system I showed you seismically imaged in the, last, in, in, the, in the last profile. Better than that, we've even got core. So there's borehole core, which has been recovered from some of these wells. And we can see right at this contact, we see these beautiful fluvial rocks. You can see these lovely rounded quartz grains, evidence of high energy reworking of these relatively mechanically tough um, grains in here. So lots of fluvial reworking. So that's consistent with the seismically imaged geomorphology. We see fluvial rocks in the core. And we also see in here, as we're going up into the marine we, uh, sequence in here, we get to more marine rocks. You can see these laminated mudstones in here. So we have some confidence in the interpretation. So how do we bring that all together? And how do we apply quantitative techniques now to look at how this relates to the, um, the kind of Iceland plume? What we can do, let me just skip back. What we can do is we can go in and look at the river long profile. So these are geomorphological techniques. We can go along and look at the elevation changes along one of these big rivers coming up into this, this in this drainage catchment that was imaged in the seismic data. And this is what it looks like, okay? So this is um, the river mouth. This is distance upstream. And this is elevation change. So 20 kilometers, 400 meters. And the black line is the real data and the red line smooth data. So as we're going upstream, you can see there's a nick point. So a nick point's kind of like a waterfall. And we see another one, and then we see another one in here. So there's these relatively steep reaches of um, the rivers. We can do an inversion. I won't go into the, um, the maths behind this, but you can invert these long profiles for an uplift history. So if we assume the Earth's surface is kind of coming up and it's just being eroded, you know, we'll just get a constant incision into it. But if we have these pulses of uplift, we'll have these waves of incision. So effectively these nick points forming. And what we can invert those river long profiles for is an uplift history, okay, through time. So this is 55 million years to 57 million years in here. So coming through that Paleocene Eocene boundary. And this is the cumulative uplift. So we can see there's one phase of uplift, another phase of uplift, and a third phase of uplift. And they're all expressed as these nick points. What's amazing is if you then go and compare the, um, the profile in the Bresse area, so this is the East, this is the East Shetland Basin data, so it just, that's the same data as I'm showing here on the left, this black line, so there's one period of uplift, two and three, as we come through that Paleocene Eocene boundary. If you compare that to this area I showed you earlier, which was in the Ferro Shetland Basin, so this is what we call the Judd area, the J, that's the light gray line. And what you see there is alpha, beta, and gamma. By an independent study, authors working several hundreds of kilometers away saw a similar 
seismic geomorphology in the in the data the subsurface data but they inverted the river long profiles to generate this uplift history and the correspondence is quite surprising you know alpha is one beta is two and gamma corresponds broadly with three although we can see there is a slight um delay if you will in the timing of uplift you know beta is kind of the onset of beta is slightly after, well, gamma is the most obvious one. It starts slightly after um, here in, in the Bresse area. So we see the same uplift, but it's delayed in Bresse, which actually makes sense. If you think that the, the Iceland plume started here and it migrated or the influence of it migrated radially through time. So the expression of it, or it would be felt later in Bresse than in Judd. So this all sort of works well together. So just to summarize, um, in the last kind of 45 minutes or so, I've taken you from the microscopic to the macroscopic to the megascopic um, kind of applications of seismic data. So we looked at seismic diagenesis, we looked at magmatism, normal faulting uh, in the macroscopic examples, and then you know the deformation of the Earth's crust with, uh, due to mantle processes. But hopefully I also convinced you that we can be quite quantitative in this analysis, right? So we're not just reduced to colouring in and pretty pictures and all the other um, slings and arrows that people may fire at us seismic interpreters. We can actually start to understand, you know, in this case, like from the Bite Basin, how ground deformation might work above um, igneous intrusions and therefore how we can try and refine our ability to predict um, geohazards or understand geohazards at least. You know, when we think about volcanology, you know, this talks to both the geohazard aspects of this, but also uh, melt generation. So if we want to try and calculate melt volumes in igneous provinces, we better be sure that we're capturing everything because we know now that there could be large volumes of igneous material beneath volcanoes, but also large volumes of igneous material, which actually flows a long, long way away from those volcanic centers. But then also, you know, I just finished here by using kind of standard geomorphological techniques which are used on modern day landscapes and showing you how they could be applied to rocks which are 55 million years old to try and back out earth surface and earth subsurface dynamics uh, tens of millions of years ago. So thank you very much I hope that um, was enjoyable and informative and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chris, for such an interesting talk. Um, I particularly enjoyed when you were talking about the 3D seismic images of the volcanoes. That was really exciting, so thank you very much. Um, we now have some time for some questions from the Discord and Zoom. I'll just start off with one that's just popped up in the Zoom. Is there significance in the greater uplift in the Judd section compared to East Shetland, proximity to the plume head? Um, yeah, so the... Yeah, so it's likely that the impact of the plume was felt most at the plume head. So where the plume head impinged on the, base of the on the base of the lithosphere, that's where you'd have the major, the, the largest amount of uplift and earliest. By the time the plume head spreads away, and I think Nikki White used to refer to it as the hot rat under the rug, which is quite a nice image, right? So you could imagine as it moves sideways, it's sort of like deforming, you know, the rug as it moves. And in this case, it's deforming the, 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 the kind of lithosphere. So as it moves sideways, the impact of that uplift may be minimized, but also later. So I think that's why the magnitude of uplift is greater at Judd than Bresse. And it's slightly later in Bresse than Judd. Um, we have another question on the Discord and it says, hi Chris, great talk. I liked how you talked about 3D seismic imaging of volcanoes. I was wondering if there would be any additional challenges when imaging submarine volcanoes as compared to terrestrial volcanoes? Oh uh, yeah, so I, I kind of obviously, yeah, I, I probably didn't explain that as well as I could. So it's actually better and easier to image buried fossilized volcanoes than modern volcanoes. Because with modern volcanoes, with reflection imaging, you've got all of the issues related to elevation um, changes. You've got access issues, you've got, um, you know, lots of kind of statics you need to deal with, with soil layers. And actually what's much easier is to do marine acquisitions. And obviously when you're doing marine acquisitions, you can then image a lot deeper down as well, probably. We can get 
typically you get better imaging marine acquisitions. Um, so in many ways, we actually prefer imaging <laughs> fossilized ancient volcanoes than modern active ones. Although, as I showed you in the Mount St. Helens case, there are ways of using not reflection seismology, but tomographic imaging um, to look underneath volcanoes. Um, just one additional thing or point to make, um, a lot of the volcanoes, I don't know if you noticed, did you notice how they were all perfectly triangular? Not many of them were eroded. And that's because we prefer, that's because a lot of the volcanoes we worked on were actually erupted in the submarine realm. They're actually submarine volcanoes. And so because if you erupt a volcano in the submarine realm, what you can do is you can subside the sedimentary basin and bury that volcano in sediments, right? And you can preserve it. Whereas volcanoes which erupted on land may be subject to um, flank collapse, erosion processes. So they're less pr um, pristine. So we like ancient submarine volcanoes. Um, there's another one from the Discord and it says, what's your perspective on the future availability of deep 3D seismic? as society reduces its dependency on hydrocarbons? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And one that I, I don't quite lie awake at night thinking about it, but because I use that data a lot, I do, I do think about it. I don't think there's gonna be any, I don't think there's gonna be any shortage of data. Quite not, you know, spatially, not a lot of the Earth's crust has been imaged with 3D seismic data, but a substantial amount has been imaged. And I think we're probably limited more so by the questions we can come up with to ask of those data. So I think the, the, the data that's been collected so far, at least in my lifetime, is, is I think there's, uh, there's, there's so many questions and there's so much data, it's hard to know where to start. So as we do reduce our dependency on um, fossil fuels and, and accordingly we go out and collect less seismic reflection data for that purpose, I do think we, you know, we will see a plateauing of the of the Earth's um, subsurface that's being imaged by those data. But I, 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 I'm, I'm not fearful of there being of running out. At least partly because of the old adage, you know, you can go back to an old data with new ideas and find something new. So there's lots of reasons to revisit old data sets. Okay, I think we've got one more um, time for one more question from the Discord. And it says, hello, really fantastic talk. You mentioned briefly about using inversion techniques to translate ground deformation to predict the amount of magma which is expressed on the surface. What challenges come about when attempting this and can this only be achieved retrospectively? Oh, right, okay. So um, Janine's on the call, so she probably knows, well, no, not she does, not, not she might. She absolutely does know more about this than I do. Um, but as I understand it, when you're looking at ground deformation in modern um, volcanic terrains, there is some uncertainty about the amount of magma that's intruded and the depth at which it's being intruded, because basically, you know, you see a ground deformation and is it a large volume quite deeply or a smaller volume at quite shallow depths? And what's the physical properties of the rocks that are being deformed above that inflating bit of magma? So there's, there's a kind of non-uniqueness to the solution which you'd want to try and minimize, obviously, if you could. Um, so as I understand, that's one of the key challenges with that sort of approach. And what we get very excited about, and Janine again knows this because we talked about it a couple of months ago, is with the seismic reflection data, we can go and look at these fossilized ancient systems. So these aren't active anymore, but we can go away and see both components, right? We can see the ground deformation and we can relate it explicitly to the size and shape and depth of the thing which caused it, which then maybe if we can couple that with an understanding of how different sediments compact and things, we could actually come up with better relationships for the relationship between the ground deformation and the intruding bodies for different compositional types. So that's what another bit of research we're going to be focusing on in the future. Yeah, that's brilliant. Once again, just like to thank you, Chris, for coming along. There is a couple more on the Discord, but we would like to go to a break now. Um, and we're just going to reconvene at 20 past three. Um, if you would like to continue the discussions in the Discord, then go ahead. The link will be posted in the chat if you've not already joined. Um, there will be a reminder five minutes before the break ends in the Discord and the Zoom chat. So we'll reconvene at 20 past